Well, you know, one of the reasons it's coming back, potentially, we assume, is because of the name, image, and likeness. And that might be the one thing in the offseason you can get everybody to agree on if it brings that game back. <laughs> okay, right off the bat, I got to tell you, this is going to be a long way around the barn intro. But that clip is from uh, ESPN College Game Day. And I feel like wokeness has taken away every sports entertainment thing I ever had. Uh, yeah, NBA is completely unwatchable. NFL, close behind. But I hold on to college football. I hold on to college football, even though I have to kind of blind my eye. Here's the point, though. Name, image, and likeness is the big news. And if you haven't heard about this, it's that now they're going to pay players. So that's enough of an intro. Here are the actual guys, the jocks, talking about the situation. And the payoff comes at the end when the ESPN guy who's, uh, you know, never played is just kind of the mouthpiece there when, when he butts in. And then I'll come back. I didn't get a dime, did you? No. I did not get a dime. Okay. I've never thought it was uh, practical or fair for colleges to make billions of dollars off the backs and sacrifices of college athletes. Yeah, the college athletes have been the workhorses for this whole system. Like, you're building a whole economic system off the backs of these workhorses, and we couldn't benefit all. I'm talking about they wanted to bleed every red penny <laughs> out of every athlete they could, every student athlete, without giving them any, anything back outside of, you know, room and board and education, which a lot of people like to talk about. But it's nothing in comparison to what they're getting from the revenue generating sports like football yeah. and basketball. It pales in comparison. The one thing I would say, Des, so, and you know, I'm staunchly in favor of all of this. I don't know that there was any malicious intent. Okay, so a fair question might be what the hell does any of this have to do with my upcoming interview with the very excellent Gary Lockman? And here is the connection. Here's what we keep bumping into, and it is a clip from. This interview I have coming up with Gary. Here it is. Well, the thing is, isn't this what everyone's been saying was supposed to have happened? The age of Aquarius is supposed to be with us, right? When all the strange stuff that was on the fringe, UFOs and paranormal stuff and cult activity and the breakdown of the mental, rational consciousness structure. And this means all, all the kind of, you know, we talk about postmodernism as post everything. Everything that was set in place during the modern period you know, when the rational mind had organized everything, everything was nice and set in place and linear and progress was happening and all that. That's all being taken apart. It's, it's eating itself up. To me, it's like a jumping off point that goes in two completely different directions is like, I love what you said. It's beyond post modernism. It's post everything. It's post rational thought. But then you said, if I got this right, is being taken down and then you said, or is crumbling kind of under its own weight? And to mm. me, that is, the, that is the debate. So the point, I think, is determining malicious intent. And I guess I'm still kind of processing the interview last time with Joe Atwell, because he's all about citizenry and what we need to do and all that. And I hesitate to go there. But the part that does ring true is we do have to fucking figure out the malicious intent. I mean, the malicious intent in NIL and college football is just about as clear as it can be. I mean, they, they just stole billions of dollars every year from these athletes. Many of them, if you want to go there, are kind of socially underserved, if you will. But however you want to slice it and dice it, they just ripped them off over and over again, year and year. And when they challenged it legally in court, which they did, you know. They pulled every trick in the book. I mean, they moved the jurisdiction, got the judges, you know, just follow it. Uh, you know, Claret, Maurice Claret a few years ago. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's it's like so many other things that are unauthorized uh, history of the United States. But I mean, this is just a clear example of, yes, they had malicious intent. I mean, it depends on what you want to call malicious, but they're out to squeeze, like Des said, every penny they could. So back to Gary. That's the, really the only question here is, you know, jump this way, jump that way. Are they trying to bring down the system? Or is the system crumbling? That's the question. And that's our job to figure out and act accordingly. Anyways, that's my idea. Here's my interview, Gary Lockman.
Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras, and today we welcome, actually welcome back, Gary Lockman to Skeptico. If you don't know Gary, he's a very, very accomplished author. I don't usually read bios, but, you know, this will kind of catapult everybody into Gary's world if you are unfamiliar with who he is. Gary Lockman is the author of 21 books on topics ranging from the evolution of consciousness, popular culture, and the history of the occult. He has written biographies of Aleister Crowley, Rudolf Steiner, Jung, Blavatsky, Swedenborg, and Colin Wilson, as well as histories of Hermeticism and the Western inner tradition. So, like I said, lot of crossover with the stuff that we talk about here. And mm -hmm. uh, as I also kind of tip my hand a little bit to Gary, I'm anxious to pull him in a couple of different directions than I normally hear him talk about. He's, he's, I think he's very uh, adept at talking about a range of these topics. So we'll have a good time. Gary, thanks for joining me. Glad you're here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on again. So, you know, um, I was, I, I bump into you every now and then because you do write so, you do write so many fantastic books. And then I was, I just kind of stumbled across this presentation you gave on consciousness to the Theosophical Society in England. And I, I thought it was really, really interesting. And I came across, it, it kind of sent me back to an earlier book that you wrote the secret history of consciousness. And I wanted to read a quote from this book. And as I read it, I want people to keep in mind that this is 20 years at this point, right? Just about, yeah, you know, just short of, but I, I was writing it 20 years ago. So it came out in 2003, so. I, I think people will get where I'm going when I read this quote. One of my motives in writing this book is to argue that the current monopoly on consciousness by scientists and academic philosophers is unfounded. <laughs> and that a whole history of thought about consciousness and its possible evolution is left out of their quote unquote official accounts. There is what I call a secret history of consciousness. And I guess I have to admit with some, a little embarrassment, I, I was stunned. I mean, that's, man that is powerful but it's it's like double powerful to think you wrote that 20 years ago i've been doing this show for the last 10 years and that's been the main theme of my show is that the monopoly of consciousness where were you at then in your headspace and hmm. this is so much part of this presentation that i saw you know where how has that shifted where have we where have we come since then well where i was then most of the time was in the british library back in the day and you know reading and rereading and um, doing the research for the book but i mean fundamentally that book uh that allowed me to unload thoughts about everything i've been reading for the last i don't know 25 years or something something like that and and i just felt and i still feel it's the case today that 99.9 percent 99 percent of the time when you have something about consciousness it's either it's it's science it's quantum quantum something or other and it's you know i don't know science of mind philosophy of mind something like that and that's fine but it does seem to me to sort of um monopolize or even ghettoize it because i think i mean i mean in the sense i mean obviously philosophy has talked about um consciousness, but not necessarily in the same way as like philosophy of mind, John Searle, and Bennett, um, Husserl, you know, Bergson, people like that. I mean, they're kind of name check, but they're, they're what they sort of arrived at or, you know, their conclusions are not necessarily, uh, unless you're doing that kind of particular philosophy, you know, it's split those guys over there, the continental philosophy, but we're doing the hard stuff over here. This is the real, that's the nice, nice, soft, you know, that's fine, but this is the, you know, real kind of stuff here. And um, <clears throat> I, I still feel like that's that, that's today. I mean, I, I find you can't. There's two things. I mean, well, there's there's the the, the three sort of size. Uh, it's there's the uh, science talks about um, uh, or the three S's. Science talks about consciousness a lot. We still that that's what we do a lot. 
Then there's the spiritual side of it, which is often in opposition to science, but it, it, it has a particular kind of way that it talks about it. And then there's the psychedelic, which is a s sound, but it's a you know PS. And then that's the consciousness too. But there's a whole other kind of area, I would say the existential, I, I, I mentioned Husserl and that whole area. And mostly because I've been, you know, very much influenced by the work of Colin Wilson, um, the British writer who, uh, well, almost 10 years ago now, 2013, he passed away. But he wrote a great deal about consciousness from a sort of phenomenological, and then into a kind of, I don't know what you would call occult or mystical or paranormal kind of way um, and throughout the 70s and 80s and all of that. But that's all kind of, I don't know, there's a certain way it just seemed to me like that sort of got lost in the shuffle and that's the area that i come out of and so i i'm i'm for me i'm, I'm just trying to have this conversation broadened uh because you can certainly find insights into consciousness and in novelists and poets and you know people of that sort it doesn't have to be you know it doesn't have to be sort of completely uh dominated by kind of the quantum uh world i think yeah, and I guess that's what I really hooked into in uh, reading that quote from the book is that it's it's like interesting. The first line that you gave me when you answered is like, I was buried in the library, you know, which there's like two parts of that. One is, and it kind of relates to, you know, like everyone winds up talking about your background. You know, it's like you're giving a presentation to the Esophical Society of England, and then you're doing another international presentation. And you know, the Washington Times, you know, or the, the, you're, you're like, a, I didn't want to say legitimate author because that's like delegitimizing. <laughs> if it, but you, oh, you're, have I finally made it? Oh, <laughs> exactly. God, thank you. Hey, thank but you. that's the thing. That's thank the thing. You. So, you know, no one at the Theosophical Society, even though it was virtual, there, there weren't uh, groupies in the background with old uh, blondie uh, uh, posters oh, okay. coming right. forward, looking for autographs. I mean, and yeah, I mean, Theosophical groupies, you really have to watch out for them. But let's see, the, the thing, the thing that I guess is, is noteworthy because you are, uh, you connect this stuff to culture and mm. very few people can make the kind of transition that you've made and fully make it, you know what I mean? Fully make it. And what I think it reflects in your work is something that I want to get into because I'm not always in sync with everything you write about, but there's a certain tenaciousness there, certain tenaciousness that fuck it. I could do this. I know I can do it. So I'm going to go fucking do it. And when you say, I was in the library, I was in the library for 20 fucking years. Yeah. I was studying this shit and I see a monopoly on consciousness that doesn't make any sense because that's the leap. You know, they had maintained this kind of really absurdity that because the, the notion, and, and you say this in the presentation, which you know, I, th I think you'd do it very well and you've done it other places is that at some level at some philosophical level it's just kind of like the emperor has no clothes here it's like really <laughs> there's consciousness is an illusion you're oh, hold on you're really going to try and put that out there i mean did, did mm. you respond to any of that well i mean of course I and mean, that was one of the things when you, you read about people like get like said john searle daniel Dennett, um um nicholas humphrey I mean, it's all this sort of explaining or explaining away, which has been going on, you know, forever. It's nothing new. I mean, it's it's the, it's it's in a way, it's it's the sort of, as we say, it's kind of the fundamental drive of that scientific view, which in itself isn't necessarily bad because it's trying to understand and it has certain paradigms, you know, to, uh, to um, use an overused word, you know that it does that, but it, in doing so, it, it has to sort of chop, it's very Procrustean, it has to chop things down to size to fit its method of inquiry. And that's where I feel like, well, there's all these things. When I, mean, I was thinking, um, I, I know in brain studies, they have qualia, this is one of the problems. Okay, there's the neurons are doing this or that, but you and I, we're not saying, oh, that's neuron number 2,672, it's lighting up next to blah, blah, blah. No, it's like, oh, that's green. Or, oh, I like that smell. Or, God, that's, I remember, where was that? That was at the seashore. So these are qualitative experience. I mean, we have the quantum, but we, we should have the qualum. But that, but, that, but, that, but that would be giving way to this kind of quantitative way to try to understand these experiences. 
we, we can't because these are experiences of a different nature you know and this is the thing where i i just feel like that gets kind of lost so, i mean i'm sure the quantum things are doing whatever they're doing all the time but whatever they're doing it doesn't equate with the strange sort of experience of actually being conscious and being self-conscious and and i mean even that for starters is <laughs> It's completely kind of, you know, very weird. But then we have all the other stuff that comes in later on, you know, the, the extended consciousness and abnormal or whatever you want to call it, paranormal kind of thing. So there's all these sorts of things that they're part of our phenomen phenomenal experience. They, they, they are, the world is like that for many people. But in, in order for whatever we want to call science to graph that, it has to chop it down to fit it in. And it gets rid of all the stuff that basically makes living worth living you know and, that, and that's where you step in and, and it's kind of like yes you're right that's nice all that qualitative stuff we know that what's make human but it doesn't really exist out in the objective world cool uh, okay and I, i'm down with that as a possible explanation have you ever thought about the conspiratorial or the potential conspiratorial aspect of it because i'll tell you where, where i started i started straight up just with the science you know so i was like Rupert Sheldrick, Dean Radin, you know, they're looking at Psy, looking at the borders of consciousness. Let's look there because that's going to kind of get to this question in kind of a boom data standpoint. Mm -hmm. But the more I got into it, and then particularly when I got into interested in near-death experience science, and I always have to add science in there because you now there's hundreds of peer-reviewed paper on near-death near experience in oh, hospital and all the rest of that stuff. Studies. And it, studies near death studies right that's the thing you just slap that on and then it's like you know well yeah. but but really if you look at the science it's like okay what were the competing theories you know it's the last gasp of a dying brain well we can get in there and we can measure that and we can measure the you know the release of endorphins chemicals we can release the dmt release we can measure all that stuff and they have and and so but i, I guess my point is where i got to the conspiratorial part really what put me over the edge was, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but probably 10 years ago when the near-death experience thing really hit and it hit with uh, Harvard neurosurgeon, Eben Alexander, comes out with a book, Proof of Heaven, and it's a phenomenal book in terms of phenomenally successful, New York Times bestseller, everyone's talking about it. And man, I mean, the cultural takedown on this guy was unlike anything I've ever seen. I mean, they were coming out of the woodwork and what was the, the Sam Harris is always my favorite one. Sam Harris comes out and says, this book is alarmingly unscientific. And this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And I remember talking to people and they go, but I thought you said he was a Harvard neurosurgeon. I go, yeah, he's a neurosurgeon. So what business is this crackpot Sam Harris who, you know, doesn't even practice the, the neuroscience. It, but but that's the way it was at Esquire magazine major takedown and it, it so the big the question there is yeah. I've come to believe that there's a certain I'm not saying it's the whole thing that there's a certain conspiratorial aspect social engineering aspect to it is that you know you thinking you're meaningless that you're a biological robot that consciousness is an illusion is kind of good for business in some ways you know what i mean uh you're not having an expanded sense of your fit in the universe beyond that uh, that might be that might be useful for certain folks hmm. well i mean i mean i, I don't i mean I, I just think there's people of that sensibility and there's some people that are extremists or fundamentalists i guess, I guess the dawkins and you know what, to tell you the truth, I, I, I have to plead ignorant. I have to be one of the few people on, uh, at least in the social media world, who I know the name Sam Harris, but I've never read or listened or heard anything. I, I, I don't, I don't pay, I, uh, who's all these other guys, Josh Rogan and people, I'm nothing against, I don't know them. They don't know me, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure they don't know me. Uh, but I, I just don't, I haven't, I'm too busy doing my own thing, so I, I don't know, you know, what, what they're about. But I do know that, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, Wikipedia seems to be slanted towards that, realm it, it tends to call anything you know slightly para pseudo you know pseudoscience or whatever no i mean I, I i noticed that and that kind of thing and i mean it just seems I, it's a hard road to hoe you know and it's always been like that um uh i mean you mentioned you know Rupert Sheldrake, dean raid and i mean i i uh, 
I don't know, a year or two ago, I did a um, seminar with uh, Dean Radin and Alex Alex Gray at the Omega Studios in upstate New York. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he it's there. The evidence is there, but the evidence has been there for a long time. I mean, in a way, it's just more of it. It's finer. It's more finely tuned. It's right there. It can't really ignore it. And if you are ignoring it, you're purposely, you know, you're not looking through the telescope uh, kind of thing. Because, um, I mean, not in any way to diminish the work that's going on now. Because the reason I'm saying this is I, I did uh, last year during the COVID sort of shutdown here, the first one, uh, which seems such a long time ago now, I wrote a short book about precognitive dreams that I've been recording for the last 40 years. You know, which your you know, personal precognitive dreams? Yeah, my own. Yeah, going back to about 1980, starting, and then um, also bringing in other people like Don J W Don, J B Priestley, and T C Lethbridge, Jung <laughs> Synchronicity, and you know lots of other you know things coming in there. So it's um, you know it's called Dreaming Ahead of Time. It's, it would have been out this this summer, but um, Corona Mania hit, and it was. Put back so it's supposed to be coming out next year but the reason i mentioned that is I, I talk about talking with dean radin about about you know that kind of thing and there's there's certainly enough evidence there to show that whatever may be behind it wh whether it's retro causality as you know eric bargo in his book time loops it's this remarkable book uh where he talks about this or whatever might be behind it it's something that you know it's on the record but yeah People who don't want to know this turn a blind eye to it. And they're still in a position where they can see the woo-woo effect is still around. You know, you used to not be able to talk about sex. Yeah. Now we can talk about sex. We can talk about the weirdest sex. It doesn't matter anymore. It's not salacious. It's not titillating. It's just, it's just, yep, this is how it is. And it's art we liberated. We can talk about it. But we we can't talk about this sort of thing without the X-Files music coming on. <laughs> An effect happening, which in one sense we want to keep because it is strange and mysterious and weird, but it's the sort of thing that allows the, you know, the still entrenched authorities to say, ah, you know, what did I, what did I tell you? It's this strange kind of, you know, weird stuff. So there, there's certainly those two ways of looking at it. And fair enough. I think the precognitive stuff is really interesting. I have a, a, a friend and a guy who's been on the show, Dr. Andy Paquette, who got a PhD at, uh, London, College London there, but is just like you. Yeah, I think he's from New Jersey originally. Actually. Really? That's, that's the strangest but, people from New Jersey. <laughs> but Andy has, the unique thing about Andy is he's very uh, meticulous about recording his precognitive genius and has recorded and databased 8,000 of them at this point. Wow. And has the ability to, through his database, kind of go in and compare. And, and he's done follow-ups. I don't know how he's had the time and persistence to do it but all that stuff you know what i call extended consciousness you know because to it it, it does seem like i don't want to just keep trying to drive home my thing but i like how you say the kind of ghettoization of consciousness i i, I think that's that's happened you know and we're, but now we're beyond that and i think that the the real movement is to keep pushing pushing beyond that and say okay that discussion is really a silly discussion uh, consciousness is an illusion i mean it just I think it was a conspiratorial absurdity at the beginning, but at the very least, can we can we acknowledge that the action is where we're at in terms of you know what is precognition, what is Eric Wargo? I don't exactly, I don't think that supports that. But near death experience, I think ET, you know, is is incredibly important, and they just came out with in the United States, you know the. Hmm. A preliminary assessment of, uh, you know, which is such a phony title, but of uh, mm. the UAP, UFO. Uh, th this shift is one of the greatest shifts in terms of the con from the consciousness standpoint, greatest shifts in our lifetime of now this disclosure that, yeah, there is this ETs in the extended consciousness realm, which if, if anyone wants to just ignore everything else and, and kind of not read that headline into it, you're kind of missing the point. I mean, so that's what they're saying. And then it sends us in an entirely different direction as well. I mean, what what does that mean? What is our place in the universe? Again, is, is redefined. So I contrast that with, you know, this talk of 
traditional science and you know i'm still one grave one funeral at a time it's like no we are way past that well the thing is isn't this what everyone's been saying was supposed to have happened the age of aquarius is supposed to be with us right more or less we're kind of not i don't know it's all rather vague when actually you we get into it you know when the meter <laughs> ticks into it but um that's all supposed to be happening and we certainly live in a time, it seems, when all the strange stuff that was on the fringe, the marginalized weird stuff, you know, UFOs and paranormal stuff and cult activity and, you know, weird politics and all that have become, become center stage, or at least they were during, you know, the uh, administration of the previous um, president. Uh, Do you think it's any less so now? Well, no, I was going to say that's the P P O T U S. But uh, well, I mean, oh, well, I mean, I'm, I just mean the sense that that's something we associate, I, I guess. Which I, and I'm, I'm, you know, not necessarily go down this road. I mean, the idea was like, whew, okay, wow, that's over. Now, now we're back, and now you know things are crumbling around us and it's been uh, it's all very strange so no i don't i i personally don't think it's over i mean nothing's ever over just i mean it's like you know what part of it what part of the story were you involved in and then you know another story starts bubbling up but um i mean i i somebody i mentioned in the book i did about trump dark star rising magic and power in the age of trump um just briefly in there um there's this German Swiss philosopher named Jean Gebser, um, who can't go into detail about his, his his ideas about consciousness. Again, like you know, only people who know his work, and this is mostly in cultural studies or sociology, um, know it. And um, but he has something called the ever uh, the, the, what he calls these structures of consciousness. Long story short, he he's he's. But he said he died in the set early 70s, but he said what we're going through um, 20th century, so the beginning of, and we, we are certainly, you know, um, going through an intensified period of, is the, what he called the breakdown of the mental rational consciousness structure. And this means all, all the kind of, you know, we, we talk about postmodernism as post everything. Everything that was set in place during the modern period, you know, when the rational mind had organized everything, everything was nice and set in place and linear and progress was happening and all that. That's all being taken apart. It's it's eating itself up. Deconstructionism, postmodernism does it. Right? Quantum did it with the physical Newtonian world already, uh, you know, in the beginning of the century. And so, so now, can I hone in on one little thing you said there? Because to me, it's like a jumping off point that goes in two completely different directions is like, I love what you said, it, it, that it's beyond post-modernism, it's post-everything, it's post-rational thought. But then you said, if I got this right, is being taken down, and then you said, or is crumbling kind of under its own weight. And to mm -hmm. me, that is the that is the debate that, that my tribe is having, is, is that being taken down? Is that an intentional effort to take that down? Or is it somehow organically crumbling because it needed to crumble and make way well, for something else. I mean, I, I would see with that, there you go. That, that's a, I guess that's a philosophical or critical sort of question because in one sense it is being taken down, but you don't need a conspiracy theory for that. It's being taken down by itself. That's why I said movements like deconstructionism and postmodernism, they're all about the end of the big narratives. They're all just by definition, postmodernism, it's the, it, in one ways, it's the most vacuous term. It's like whatever came after modernism. <laughs> It's like that's why it's like what I'm, I'm I, I used to say I'm, I'm interested in pre next thingism, you know, you know, I'm, I'm before whatever the next thing is, you know, right. and so there's stuff is oh, I'm, I'm after whatever that was. And it's like, that's fine. That gives you a linear temporal kind of placement. But your, what's your content? And both of those movements are contentless, postmodernism contentless. It takes bits and pieces of other things and plays around with them. Velcros them together, whether it's architecture or you know whatever form. And deconstructionism, it, by definition, it doesn't make anything. It takes things apart. Well, in that case, you have to have something that's made already that you can take apart. And what what did they take apart? They took apart the Western civ tradition. That's what they've been doing. And somebody like Trump, who knows nothing about this, just 
he just got the whiff. Oh, reality is what we say it is. And this, that's in that book. What I'm saying in that book is that there's a, a few different trajectories of attacking the notion of a stable objective reality with a capital R or a stable objective truth with a capital T that is available for objective you know, inquiry through the rational mind. That is so 20th century, man. That's like gone. And, and he ran with it. He doesn't know the first thing about postmodernism, all this kind of stuff, but he knew, oh, reality is what you make of it. And that's the positive thinking side, you know, Norman Vincent Peale and all that. But that all ties in with occult thought, with new thought and, met, excuse me, magical thinking. And so, and then the other side of it is the reality TV, where, you know, he, he popped out of television. I mean, and again, that, that's sympathetic magic, whatever you want to call it. And then these guys, you know, the whole Peppy the Frog kind of thing, which is supposed to have helped him get elected. You know, what happened to him kind of, one wants to say naturally, or let us just say kind of on its own, where he, he popped out of television after being the guy in The Apprentice, where he hired and fired, then he actually became the big guy who hired and fired. That happened by itself. But the reason he got to be in that was these guys helped him, you know, using the internet. And I mean, this is, I'm, 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 again, <clears throat> This is what they say happened. And but it's it's we live in this strange time where that reality has just been kind of, you know, the seams of, of it's something the the, the the aporia, which is what you do. You find you find the loose thread and you pull it. And in many ways, you don't need any kind of conspiracy theory about that. That this is what makes our time strange. All I'm just trying to characterize why our particular time is strange. I'm not saying there aren't conspiracies. I don't know, they may be. I, I stay away from them because I stay away from the trap doors. You open a trap door and you keep opening trap doors. But they're all trap doors. I, I mean, it's the thread. I, I it's the thread that you're talking reality about. Itself, in one sense, we don't need it because reality itself has become like that. Now. Completely. I mean, th yeah, that's the so starting Maybe point. there's a conspiracy behind making it so. Maybe that's the case. Maybe there's a conspiracy uh, uh, behind making reality. I mean, one of the people I talk about in Dark Star Rising is... Russian fellow Alexander Dugan. He was a professional conspiracy theorist for a while. He was inventing conspiracy theories for the Russian press and all that. This was part of the whole, you know, the the the, the gigantic kind of well, you could say conspiracy theory that Putin had um, installed over Completely. the Russian people. You know, but that, well, in a sense, it's sort of like an invented reality. You invent reality. You know. So here, here's my thing. I like kind of we could take this discussion in two ways or, or it's always going to kind of loop back and the snake is going to eat its tail and all that kind of stuff because fundamentally your understanding and you build this up with the data and the evidence and the philosophical data if you can call it that is that there you know our reality is it, at the very least we can say it's a lesser reality it's a lesser reality. We are looking through the long end of the telescope and there's other people. And this is what the extended consciousness uh, literature comes back, right? So people have a near-death experience. They come back and go, oh, I had a comparable download. I knew everything and now I'm back at this body and I don't, you know what I mean? Or in your precognitive yeah. dreams, there's this expanded beyond space time. I know more than I know now. And yet we yeah. always want to shift gears and downshift and go, no, wait a minute. I'm back in. I'm back in charge here. Let me tell you how it all works. And so we, we can always shift to that mode and say, you know, we don't know shit, which is always going to be true. But here's the part that I guess is is kind of tough, though. So and then let me make one other point about Dark Star Rising. Brilliant insight, brilliant insight that no one had. And for you to connect the Trump, you know, new thought movement which again, just kind of totally flies under the radar and everyone goes, oh yeah, that's great. That's, a, yeah, I have a picture of a, of a Range Rover on my refrigerator because that's what I want. You know, it's like, okay, but explore that philosophically, what that means in terms of how you see the world, how you see reality on the rest of this. But when you get to the conspiracy stuff, it's like, if we are going to play that game, it's like the dark star rising. Where are we with, uh, Hillary and Mariana in spirit cooking, which connects directly to Aleister Crowley. I mean, don't we at least have to go, shit, man, because 
first of all, you want to talk about conspiracy. It, again, this is one that flies under the radar. Is this a conspiracy? Fuck yes, it's a conspiracy. 400, uh, you know, uh, thousands of emails, the most incendiary emails are released four days before the election and they sink Hillary's boat. I mean, that's not like, Oh, that just that just happened by chance. Somebody it's released politics. This. <laughs> it's, it's politics, politics, but it's also conspiratorial, and it's yeah. also right into this world. I mean, you wrote a biography mm -hmm. on Aleister Crowley, mm -hmm. and I know your biographies are kind of real biographies, but the connection to, you know, mm -hmm. Mariana mm -hmm. and Hillary and spirit kicking. And yeah, all I have to say, I mean, people have have uh, criticized me, or at least brought to my attention that I, I have nothing to say about. Which I have to say. I didn't pay any attention to that. No, not because I'm a Hillary fan at all. At all, no, I mean not. You know, um, so I have to say I I don't I don't know about that. I mean I know what it is, <laughs> the PizzaGate sort of thing. But I have to say I'm one of these people because I there's a kind of necessary ignorance <laughs> in order to sort of do my work. I have to sort of you know feel things out. So I have again I'm I'm just you know pleading that I don't know enough about that to have anything intelligent to say about it. Fair enough. Um, and, and I guess, hold on, because I want to say something that, that this relates back to the first part is that I could be totally off on this, but that's the kind of tenaciousness that I think it takes to kind of make the transition that you did in your life to be kind of like uh -huh. there and say, oh, no, I can shut that off. And you want to pull me into that world? I refuse. I'm staying here and this is my lane well, and I'm going to run that lane. Yeah. But I do want to pull you in there a little bit. I do want to pull you in there no, a little no, bit. No, no, no. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you do. But I'm, that's why I'm saying I'm, I'm doing it public here on live and, and admitting my ignorance, which many people wouldn't do. You know, they would, they would perhaps try to say something that sounded like they knew what they were talking about. Which I, you could say I do that most of the time anyway. But that's true. But <laughs> at least on this occasion, I'm, I'm, I'm being Socratic and, 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 admit, and admitting. By ignorance. So, I mean, that's the thing. A lot of people that, I guess, were pro-Trump are sort of like, oh, man, you're just doing this occult Trump stuff, but you're not doing anything about that kind of there. And I just have to say, I mean, the reason I wrote the book Dark Star is that my 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 editor at, uh, at uh, Torture Penguin asked, asked me to do it. Um, and it was like, okay, go for it. So I, I followed that trail. I mean, I know there's a broader kind of studies about that side, too. Um, I guess you could say you know, a cult politics on the left, or I don't know, are they the left? Is Hillary the left? Or she's, I guess she's just Democrat. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a reality. A, I, 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 I did do a book earlier called Politics in the Occult, which the main argument of it is to say that there is a kind of progressive occult politics. Um, you know, people like Madame Blavatsky or, or Annie Besant, who was the head of the Theosophical Society. They were both very much involved with Indian independence. Victoria Woodhull, who was the first woman to run for president in 1872. She was a mesmerist and a healer and a psychic. She also translated the Communist Manifesto. And she had a, um, a, a Wall Street brokerage firm. She was one of these remarkable women, you know, in the, in the 19th century. Uh, and she was a free love advocate. So, uh, okay, so I'm just saying there, there is this kind of history of a kind of Progressive, let us let us say, occult politics, and, and I, one of the most, you know, one, one, of the, uh, uh, one thing I was going to say, just 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 because I'm, I'm giving a talk about this actually in Denmark um, next month, so this is kind of on my mind. I just wanted to say, you know, the recent um, explosion or eruption of the id uh, at the capital, you know, <laughs> when the, the the barbarians entered and all that, um, that you know, that was kind of like the kind of burst of this kind of whatever you want to call it, the, the occult spell happening at that time for Trump, you know, just retreated, whatever. But um, that reminded me more than anything else of um, the attempt in 1967 to, to exercise and levitate the Pentagon. So, but that was from a leftist, that was an anti-war march. So I, I, I'm not equating it, but it was a similar sort of, you know, irrational, kind of attempt at occult politics in a way. I'm just saying that to say that, yes, th th this stuff happens on that side of the political spectrum as well. Interesting. Great, great stuff. And I like how you're holding the line. It's important. It keeps bringing us back to realizing where the line is when you keep holding it. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, the political. I don't I don't believe that. I, I think Trump is a brand, uh, just like I think Biden is a brand. I don't think those are real 
I, I don't believe in anything what we would call traditionally political. It just seems like such a farce. But I do want to make sure we get to the underlying questions here that I don't always see you kind of square off on directly. Like a couple of years ago, I wrote a book, Why Evil Matters. And the premise of the book was that it, science, it's right up your alley, but it's like science denies evil in one way. And then religion, you know, boxes it in, you know, and says this, and then it, it might be our best lens to really kind of get a better understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about consciousness. Because when we move to talk about evil and somebody, well, that's just a social construct or this, and then you start really nailing it down because there's a plenty of evil in the world. And that was the whole purpose. It's oh. kind of as a thought exercise to say, okay, now I got you to a point where you go, okay, you know, the woman I interviewed who was sold into the Belgian uh, uh, sexual satanic uh, cult there at six years right. old, and they have pictures of it, you know, the Dutro thing, and here's the woman who is there, and, you know, six years old, sold by her mother, raped a thousand times, and then people go, oh, yeah, that's fucking evil, okay, now we can, so, you know, yeah. you gotta drive the stake in the ground, but I, I say all that because, like, to me, one of the fundamental questions, and this whole thing, is, is there a moral imperative? Is there good and bad? Are there good thoughts, bad thoughts? In, in any context you want to say, where, where do you come down on that? You know, is there a moral imperative? Is there good and bad? Oh, well, I, you know, I would say, well, fundamentally, yes. I mean, but it sounds, what, what you just described to me, this poor woman, um, you know, it's horrific. What can you say? You can't, you can't say anything about it. But, but you can't um, say whether it's have, evil. No, 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 no. Well, I mean, again, it, it, you, 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 you give this this absolutely horrific, you know, <laughs> person's existential experience. Whatever I'm going to say is going to sound absolutely platitude, you know, platitudinous and, and a truism after that. But at the same time, we're talking about this thing, evil. Which okay, one has to say, okay, what do you mean? Do you mean like there's the prince of evil somehow, a, a satanic, a dark principle that actually is actively evil, or is evil the absence of good? Just like darkness is the absence of light. What do you think? We 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 we, we don't have a we don't have a dark flashlight like we're you know some some supervillain might have a, a thing where he can shoot a beam of darkness at you. But we can't do that. We 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 can dispel darkness with light. So I mean, this this is the Christian. This is the you know this is the argument. Jung had this argument. You know, when he, when he answered to Job and all that. You know, um, you know, I, I, my my Latin isn't good enough, but it's like you know the privation of the good, privatio boni. You know, that's it's the absence of good. Is there an active evil force in the world? This is the Manichaean kind of thing. I don't know, but when you see some things, I mean, you know, Colin Wilson, as I said, whose work he he wrote about evil. He wrote about serial killers. He wrote he was writing about he was writing existential studies of killers like Jack the Ripper and the P P Peter Curtin, who's like people don't most people don't know about him. He's a Dusseldorf murderer. The film M that Peter made Peter Laurie's name, the Fritz Lang film M, is about him. But that's actually a toned down um, uh, take on his life because this guy was. Absolutely. I mean, the, what he did, but he was, and, but in his everyday life, he was actually quite nice. People liked him, and he was good to his wife, and even arranged for her to get the reward money. <laughs> you know? So it's people are strange. We are weird beings, and this evil. I mean, this is the thing that drove Dostoevsky nuts. You know, that's why it's the, Ivan Karamazov in the Brothers Karamazov says, you know, I, I. There may be a great cosmic plan in which, in the end, everything works out fine, but I can't accept it because I cannot accept what strikes me as the point, the suffering of, of a child. And he's talking, there's some you know, horrific condition, like, like the woman you're telling me about. What cosmic plan necessitates that? Okay. Uh, but then his brother, Alyosha, who's the religious mystic, he has a vision in which all is good. And that's Dostoevsky's punchline. In all of his books, there's somebody who gets this all is good kind of thing. It's completely irrational. It, it, it's beyond the rational mind. We cannot explain it. You have the experience and you feel like, yes, even that is good. It, it, somehow, and it's not this worked out Hegelian plan where everything you know, finally works out. No, no, no. It, it, isn't, it isn't, the suffering isn't gone. It's not 
suddenly evil turned into good, but somehow, somehow, this overwhelming sense of yay saying, which Colin Wilson charted out in his book, The Outsider, people like Nietzsche and Blake and some of the others had this experience where it's this vital energy, life affirming sense of yes, that just trumps, sorry to use that word, all of the pain and suffering. That, well, that word is no longer viable, right? It's a, you know, but hey, no, that that's great, Gary, and I appreciate yep. it. And you know, just so you know, I'm not Christian, I'm not religious. And <clears throat> kind of part of my investigation, this was a guy <clears throat> who is a clinical psychologist, you know, and I was doing this, doing a bunch of shows, and he wrote me an email and says, hey, I love the show, but you don't have a fucking clue about evil. And he went on to describe how he had come to understand it through kind of channeled information and that it, the important thing I think was that there's this extended realm in which it parallels our realm and that there is malevolence there, you know? So yeah. oh, I don't, yeah. I don't know how to process yeah. it. And I love the way you're, you're dancing with it. That seems to me to be really wonderfully important. And that's why we come back to you because you are, you know, you're not going to be pinned down with a cheap answer. So let, let me then <laughs> add to well, that. I mean, I, mean I, I'm, I was going to say Swedenborg, who I've written about, he said the spirits are around us, you know, all the time. And there are dark, you know, evil spirits, you know, they're kind of the low life, you know, um, the, the, the kind of As people. below, so above. I mean, we don't have yeah, to look yeah, very I far to see. So, I mean, uh, we've got nothing better to do than than, than to create pain. So, this is the thing, there's, there is some kind of, I don't want to call it. There's some kind of it, it's it's whatever it is. The life force gone sour and gone in on itself, and it becomes this kind of malevolent thing that does actually it enjoys the pain and suffering of others. So I would say yes. That that to me would be if you knowingly enjoy the pain and suffering of others, and not in some um, kind of consensual weird <laughs> sexual kind of thing. But I I don't mean that. I I, I mean some poor child that you've got trapped somewhere and that that child's cries of absolute terror you know give you give you a frisson then that to me would be you know evil i would say let me pull in a couple other of these extended consciousness things and see how you're kind of working them into your your thought patterns. Reincarnation, I think, is super interesting. And again, I like it because there's science, you know, you go to the guys at University of Virginia, and they will blow you away at the science and you just have to throw up your hands and like you were saying about precognition and Dean Ray, and you go, okay, so that that is happening in this, you know, small r, big r reality. But that, so how do you process the reincarnation thing? What do you make of it? I have to say, I've never really, I, I've always had a perverse interest in this notion of eternal recurrence rather than reincarnation. Just, I mean, sim I say perverse on purpose because, um, well, it didn't initially start. I mean, eternal recurrence is that the, the, we've had this conversation countless of times before, and we will have the same conversation countless of times uh, again. And this is a notion that's associated with the philosopher Nietzsche. Uh, the Russian P.D. Uspensky, who was um, most known as a student of Gurdjieff, but he's a brilliant philosopher in his own right. He, he talked about it, but in a different way. But <laughs> I, was, I got interested in it because I, I, I read Nietzsche when I was you know, in my teens and all that. But um, also in the late 80s, and early 90s, I worked at um, the preeminent metaphysical bookshop west of the Rockies, this place called the Bodhi Tree. Um, it's not there anymore, but it was very famous. It was made famous by Shirley MacLaine in the 80s with that, um, whatever, right. I think it was Out on the Limb or something. Great, about, great. About, her, about her experience where she was, you know, experiencing out of the body stuff and channeling and a variety of things like that. And I started working there actually around the same time that I was working that this thing, Harmonic Convergence. Started. In any case, I'm getting off point. But the reason I, I, I became kind of, I say perversely kind of interested in eternal recurrence because everybody there was talking about who they were in their past life. And I said, nope, nope, that's just it. No, you were just you. Sorry. <laughs> so that, that was more, you know, you know, giving them a hard time about it. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I was very, I mean, when I read a great deal of Rudolf Steiner, you know, he, re reincarnation is a very, very uh, central um, item in, 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 in his system. And, um, you know, 
I don't know. I mean, how should I say? I I I know is it, it's um, Ian Sanderson, and I mean those days are the early kind of people working on it. And I know today there's more, so there's enough kind of evidence in some way that points to it. So I don't know. I mean, I, I guess there's two different. Well, there's more than two, but there's one is the kind of scientific where whoever it might be, the young boy suddenly has memories of something, and it's it's recorded and improving and all that. And then there's the sort of philosophical let's say you know or the metaphysical kind of teaching about it you know so um but i I, i'm so busy you know with this world here and now that i i i I don't think about where i was before and i i dread having to worry about where i'm going next (laughs) you know please there's enough there's enough for me to deal with i'm very existential in that way you know, I, I think that's a, a, a lot deeper than you're kind of letting on, and I appreciate that you're just dishing off with a laugh. I'm glad you reminded us of uh, Shirley MacLaine in that whole uh, era for people who weren't there or don't haven't read about it. That was the 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 that was the zeitgeist, right? Who were you? I was ISIS. You know, I was the, everyone had these. You know, it it really got to be so. It was comical, you know. Past life uh, regression that was happening all the time. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it was a fantastic place to be. In fact, I'm thinking I I, I have to write uh, my memories of it before you know I, I don't remember them anymore. But it was a fantastic time. You know? But the other thing that you mentioned, I think, is particularly interesting, and it's often you know because the way you broke it down, I think, is quite quite spot on. In that you know the scientific data, like you go look at. Uh, uh, Jim Tucker at University of Virginia and Ian Stevenson and all that stuff. And you just got to go, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, you got me. You know, you turned my arm, up, twisted my arm, and I got to admit it. But the other thing is like, to your point, you go talk to uh, some of the Zen people and some of the other Buddhist people and they go, no, you've missed, you've missed the point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the point is, there is only now, right? So any thought that you might have of past life, future life, you, you, you've already missed the point. So come back to, you know, and, and even if you're not like super Zen about it, you, you do see essentially what you're saying, which is my only job is to be completely engaged in, I couldn't be. I mean, yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about me personally. So it's not, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not prescribing for others. I mean, I, I know, I mean, other people, I mean, I write about this stuff, but I think in order to write about it, you have to be a bit sort of detached from it. You know, if you, if you're, um, too much. How should we say it? My, my left brain is interested in what my right brain is doing. <laughs> it's trying to like talk about it. But no, I mean, I, I'm, I mean, no, you're interesting. You, you say Zen because when I was a teenager, this was one of the first things I got interested in back in the very early 70s. It was like in, growing up in New Jersey, we got the tail end of, you know, um, the 60s. And I was doing my own thing whenever I was like 71 or something like that. But, um, yeah, reading D.T. Suzuki and obviously the Dharma Bums and, you know, and Kerouac's novel and Alan Watson and all that. But I just strangely enough recently went back and came across the book of Suzuki's at a charity shop here around back. And you know, I mean, you know, having, I mean, I read this ages ago and having done, you know, all this other stuff, a lot of it said, oh, I understand in a way what he's talking, at least what they talk about the Zen experience, which any Zen person would say, well, you, you've lost it already as soon as you start talking about it. <laughs> Yeah. But it is, it is this kind of right brain kind of way of seeing and being in the now, in the present, and not being um, hurried and harangued by your obsessive left brain ego who always wants to do things. And I'm sadly one of these people who is like that. You know, I'm, I, I find it really difficult to sit and do nothing. I mean, I'm constantly, and, um, but I'm, I have of late been consciously trying to do that more. And I've even started listening to Shaku Hachi you know, bamboo flute music on YouTube, which I have to say, you know, this is one of the wonderful things about the online world that I have access to that now. That's awesome. What's next? What do you want to do for the next act? Um, well, I, I, in many ways, I want to take the long deferred and much needed rest I've been saying for the last 20 something years I need. Um, but um, I have an idea for something like a memoir, um, I've uh, I, I mentioned that I'm, I'm you know talked about writing down these memories of working at the Bodhi Tree and things like that. Um, so, something along those lines. I mean, I'm actually at the moment I'm working on a book about um, a fellow named Morris Nichol, 
who started out as a Jungian. He was the first um, of Jung's representatives in Britain and England. But then he changed his allegiance to Gurdjieff and Uspensky um, in the early 1920s. And he spent a year at Gurdjieff's Prairie, his Institute for Harmonious Development of Man in Fontainebleau. For your listeners who don't know who Gurdjieff is, he was this enigmatic um, Greco sort of Turkish esoteric teacher in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and um, he uh, gathered around himself quite a few um, uh, sort of intellectual um, and cultural uh, people. Um, the uh, Well, the Russian philosopher Peter Uspensky, who I mentioned earlier, and the writer Catherine Mansfield, and um, <clears throat> people like that. And um, uh, Nickel was a student of his for a while at this strange place that he had in, in Fontainebleau outside of Paris in the 20s where um, it was a, <laughs> certainly a, a, a strange place for most of these people who were sort of, you know, you know more or less, you know, um, well-off, well-heeled intellectuals and, and writers and cultural people over, uh, in, in, in England at the time who we went there. And they were mostly um, uh, <laughs> given all this very hard physical work to do, along with all these kind of psychological exercises and things. So in any case, um, he, he's, he, he sort of got lost in the shuffle of uh, different people that um, came out of this time. And um, I've been approached by someone to do a book about him and having written about Uspensky and also Jung. And Nickel was also later in his life um, by the reader of Swedenborg, who I, I mentioned briefly. And I've written a book about him as well. So uh, it seems I you know, might be the person to, to do it. That's fantastic. Uh, you know, I kind of get the feeling when I hear about the origins of these books you're talking about, your, your, your vacation, Val, <laughs> forget about it. They're going to keep, yeah, well, it's, the, you know, it's the old line from The Godfather, they keep pulling me back, you know, I mean, yeah. I, well, you know, necessity is the mother of production. That's my, <laughs> that's my, pa my paraphrase on that. So that's how it is. So I'm still waiting for the big one to happen. But uh no, I mean, um, I, I, I enjoy doing it and I enjoy giving talks. And um, I uh, teach an occasional course with the California Institute of Integral Studies. I just did one recently this summer on my book, Lost Knowledge of the Imagination. And so that, that's gratifying too. So. Again, our guest has been right. very excellent. Gary Lockman, it's been terrific, terrific talking to him. And uh, the website's uh, very nicely done, number one, but also oh. it has a lot of stuff there and it's it's nicely laid out, you know, which shouldn't be a big deal, but it it is nowadays, you know. Well, I'm glad, I'm you, glad can, you said because I'm actually thinking I, 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 I need to revamp it. So I'm, I'm glad you say that. Well, you know, anyone, that's just kind of the personal thing. But I, what I liked is, you know, like you go over here and it's what you want, interviews, articles, talks, and other things. And it's all super accessible and there's you know nice. just a line or two about what you're going to find there and then the links work <laughs> and then well, you know good. it's it's just kind of nice and the some of the photography is very uh, nice yeah. and, uh, just the facts man just the facts <laughs> <laughs> well it's been a great reconnecting with you and uh, i really appreciate nice. it so gary thanks again pleasure well thank you very much and um yeah uh, good luck uh, with the next one Thanks again to Gary Lockman for joining me today on Skeptico. Question I tee up is the obvious one. Malicious intent? Question mark. Are they trying to break down the system or is the system just breaking down? Let me know your thoughts. Skeptical Forum, come on over. Join me, Skeptical Forum. I, if you are interested in getting an answer from me or getting a response from me or dialoguing with me, I, you just go to the Skeptical Forum and I respond to everything there. Anyways, until next time, take care. Bye for now.